Not so many years ago, we were being treated to frequent updates on the origin of life. It started with the Miller and Urey experiment. We were told they'd produced the building blocks of life and were very close to producing life itself. This rapidly morphed into a notion of prebiotic soup, where all the molecules of life were swarming around, just about to come together in all the complexity of proteins and RNA and DNA and living organisms. Prebiotic soup was so popular that Campbell started selling it. But scientists started admitting among themselves that experiments like Miller and Urey actually showed that life probably could not have started on Earth at all. Prebiotic soup may still be on Campbell's product list and it may still feature in some outdated textbooks, but scientists regard it as an embarrassment best forgotten. The story gradually changed to life starting on some far distant planet, or arriving on Earth on dust from comets, or on the Moon, which was sent from some far distant galaxy by extraterrestrials with all the genetic material to populate the Earth. But it's all been a bit quiet lately, not much in the way of confident claims of the imminent production of life from non-life, which we'd become used to. In fact, the whole field of evolution has gone surprisingly quiet. The evolutionists have been very busy studying the hurdles which must be overcome before evolution could be considered a halfway plausible hypothesis. And the origin of life has become ever more intractable. We saw in episode 20 that even Morovitz gave up conventional origin of life research and turned to attempting to find out how basic laws of thermodynamics might explain the origin of life. Of course, the existing laws of thermodynamics deny that evolution is possible, and he didn't find any new ones, nor, apparently, did his collaborators. The problem with origin of life research is that the more they've looked into it, the greater the complexity revealed, and the greater the improbability of it happening by itself. That improbability is now recognised by just about everybody in the field as being utterly implausible. But the field is full of ardent atheists who know full well that George Wald was right when he said either life is the result of a creative act of God or of chance events arising to evolution. There is no third alternative. And something has become as clear as daylight since the coming of the information era. Information is produced only by the working of intelligence. The atheist philosopher Anthony Flew, the darling of atheists such as Richard Dawkins, was forced to admit that evolution cannot account for the fact that a single cell can contain more information than all of the volumes of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. Evolution can't explain the existence of information which would be contained in just one line from just one page of an encyclopedia. Of course, a creative act of God has no problem with explaining the existence of vast amounts of information. But an atheist can't admit that. And since all the research shows that there's no chance of the simplest theoretically possible cell coming about by itself, the atheists have been forced to a pathetic solution. They claim there must have been a simpler form of life, life not built on DNA, RNA or any of the amazing molecules of the life we know, but on something else. On what? Nobody knows. Is there any evidence for such life? No, not a trace. Is there any idea of how it could have worked? 
No, none whatsoever. So what reason is there for belief in this totally unsubstantiated story? It's the only way to carry on believing that evolution of life from non-life could have happened. And the atheists don't put forward this pathetic story tentatively. Oh no, remember last time when Professor Dave promoted this idea as an absolutely certain fact and poured scorn and ridicule on all who don't believe it? Well, let's listen to what he said next. Molecules have never been shown to evolve toward life. Never. They don't evolve toward life. There's no impetus to evolve toward life. Molecules don't move toward life. That's right. Molecules never, ever evolve to life. Well, they sure did, because here we are. Did you hear that? In spite of all the evidence, experimental and theoretical, that life cannot evolve from non-life, the fact that life exists proves it must have evolved from non-life. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. And finally, our learned professor just had to excel himself with his parting shot. So James, I'll leave you with this. You have a choice. You can be a scientist, or you can be a preacher. You can't be both. I don't know what his definition of a scientist is, or even if he would call himself a scientist. But I think few would doubt that James Clark Maxwell was a scientist of the highest order. He was a Methodist lay preacher. And few scientists come anywhere near the stature of Leonard Euler, who was a fine preacher an exceptional Bible study leader. And, of course, we could point to Arthur Wilder Smith, one of the outstanding scientists of recent times, another skilled preacher. I think we can conclude that James Tour is in good scientific company. And instead of paying attention to Dave's loud, blustering twaddle, it would make more sense to follow some good advice. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.